I was standing with the organizers. Um, I added the subtitle, uh, What Disagreement Can Teach Us About Semantics and What Semantics Can Teach Us About Disagreement. So um, um, I have three aims in this talk. Uh, the first is to provide a survey and a critical assessment of the so-called argument from faultless disagreement and the role that it has played in philosophy of language and semantics in the last 10 to 15 years. So the, the argument started as an argument uh, provided by relativists to the effect that um, we need to, uh, to abandon our traditional semantic frameworks and adopt the relativist framework. And I think that there is a growing consensus that the argument has failed. Uh, it doesn't show that we need to uh, switch to different semantics. But on a more positive note, um, what, it, what the discussion has done, it has led to some very fruitful um, and interesting results. And what I'd like to do uh, in the second part of the talk is uh, show, um, uh, using a case study, how the fine grained structure of meaning at the level of words, sentences, and discourse um, reveals sources that can lead to disagreement. And then at the end, I will um, discuss some features of predicate of personal taste more specifically and argue that they are interestingly different from aesthetic and moral predicates, which suggest that uh, consequently disagreements on matters of taste uh, may require somewhat different analysis than uh, ethical and uh, aesthetic disagreements. So for the disagreement revisited. Um, so photos disagreement is usually presented as a puzzle uh, and we have a dialogue uh, of a form. So imagine that Katie and Rob have just tasted a certain dish uh, which has lots of parsley um, <coughs> and Katie says this is delicious and Rob says no it isn't. Now we have three intuitions that may arise with such a dialogue. Um, one is that if we assume that uh, to Katie the dish uh, tastes delicious, uh, when she says this is delicious, she's speaking truly, and similarly, if Rob doesn't, uh, if he doesn't taste good to uh, Rob, he's also speaking truly and saying no, it isn't delicious. Um, but we also have the intuition that they disagree, and that's uh, signaled by uh, the fact that uh, Rob seems to deny what Katie has asserted by saying no, it isn't. Um, and then there is uh, well, the intuition that. A disagreement, if a disagreement is genuine, uh, that precludes uh, uh, the possibility that the two parties um, are both speaking truly. So the problem, the puzzle, arises from the fact that we, these three intuitions um, can't uh, hold together. Now, um, so the relativist argument from this kind of uh, puzzle, um, there is both a positive and a negative version of the argument. The positive argument uh, aims to show that the relativist has the best explanation of this kind of um, uh, cases. And a negative argument is an argument against rival views, especially contextualist views, but also invariantist and expressivist. Now, um, so um, what I'd like to do is for discuss the positive uh, argument and show that uh, it doesn't um, go through and then discuss uh, the negative argument. Now, the positive argument, uh, one way to see it, and I should mention that not all relativists um, take faultless disagreement to be a, a very important case. In particular, John McFarland, he, he has a different view. But so this, so Max Kobel, Mark Richard, and uh, Peter Lazerson uh, are the ones who initially thought that would, I think, uh, endorse this sort of argument. So the argument takes the form of an inference to the best explanation. Um, they would argue that both the intuition of faultlessness is important and we need to preserve it, that the intuition <coughs> of disagreement is also important and that we need to preserve it, and that the best thing to do is give up uh, the idea that disagreement precludes the possibility uh, that the two parties are speaking truly, so then they present a relativist framework as one which uh, provides a notion of disagreement uh, that allows for the possibility of falsehoods. So that's, that's basically uh, the idea. And um, now, without going into the technical details of the kind of relativist semantics that they had in mind, uh, let me sort of present it very informally. So um, um, what, what they do in the relativist frameworks is see the content of an assertion and contents no longer as propositions, no, well, uh, no longer as 
as mappings from uh, possible worlds to truth values as it's done in uh, traditional semantics, but as mappings from sequences that involve agents and possible worlds into truth values. So that's the definition of content uh, in the relative semantics. And then they um, define this agreement uh, by saying that uh, A and B disagree if there is a content such that A asserts uh, that content and A B denies that content. Okay, so then like, the idea would be, uh, okay, this says uh, this dish is delicious, uh, Rob says no it isn't, uh, the content uh, at stake is that uh, uh, the parsley dish is delicious, but to get the truth value it takes an agent uh, and the possible world. Now why, um, I'll go, I, I'm going quickly, but uh, there is a very uh, kind of in straightforward problem with this kind of explanation is that it's not really clear how a relativist can um, really make sense of the idea that we have faultless disagreement. So let's grant the relativist that contents are such mappings from agents into truth values and assume that Katie, uh, well, that she, um, when she asserts uh, this is delicious, she aims at asserting something truth and valuable, namely something true, and she's also a um, competent speaker, so she's aware that the content that she asserts in order to get the truth value must be evaluated at an agent. So um, uh, when Katie asserts this is delicious, um, so we have uh, two possibilities. So she might, uh, uh, in asserting her content, she may intend the content to be evaluated for the truth value at herself. Uh, while Rob, when he denies the content that the dish is delicious, so he similarly knows that it needs to be evaluated for a truth value at an agent, so he might intend that content to be evaluated at himself. So even though there one asserts a content and the other denies, to the extent that they're aware that uh, the contents get only truth values with respect to the agents, and that it's mutually clear between them that she wants her content to be evaluated at herself and he wants his content to be evaluated at, his, at himself, uh, there is, it is really unclear to see why we should see them as disagreeing. Uh, on the other hand, if they, uh, well, she asserts the content, he denies it, and they both intend their respective contents to be evaluated at the same agent or group of agents, so for example, people in general, so they will be dis disagreeing, but then the relativist loses faultlessness because they are not going to be both speaking truly. So that's the sort of problem that I think is um, shows that as a semantic framework, uh, relativist semantics doesn't give you the notion of faultless disagreement. Now. Um, as I mentioned, the, the argument was also presented as uh, an argument against various existing semantics, among which a contextualist frameworks. And I think what's really been fruitful in the discussion is that it has triggered a number of um, responses to the argument, and it has um, and I've come, invited people to pay attention to the disagreement cases. So what I'll do, what they do in the paper and what I'll do here is um, <coughs> look at five responses. So um, it doesn't, this is not exhaustive, um, and some of the labels are mine. So I will look at uh, the underdetermination approach, which is the one I proposed in, a, in an old paper from 2007. Uh, and I start with this one because uh, it's the kind of approach I I favor, but also because it was one of the first um, in response to, uh, in particular, Lazerson's paper. Then a metasemantic approach by Michael Glansberg, a metalinguistic approach, the presupposition of commonality approach, and the attitudinal approach. And I should mention in advance that I think that th these approaches, they're not, uh, so even though like, they've been given as like responses to the argument, what's really happening is that they're not competing with each other, they're not uh, excluding each other, to the contrary, uh, as we'll see in the second part, they often, uh, <laughs> they show phenomena which often arise and uh, at the same time. Okay, so, um, uh, so the, the, rea the response I, I uh, had with respect to this kind of argument um, went something like this. When we just look <coughs> at the dialogue, this is delicious, no it isn't, 
Admittedly, it does trigger uh, the intuition of faultlessness and the intuition of disagreement, but uh, it's a mistake to take such dialogues at face value, and what we really need to do is look more closely at the context in which such a dialogue may arise, and in particular at the ways in which a dialogue might evolve to see whether <coughs> it really is a disagreement or rather whether it's a case of a dialogue where the two parties are expressing their own preferences. So, um, for example, from this is delicious, no it isn't, you might um, uh, have a case where then Katie sort of backs up and says, well, look, all I mean to say is that to me it is delicious, and Rob might similarly say, um, okay, fair enough, uh, and to me it tastes like a bitter, dry, and rough piece of rubbish that's actually from <laughs> Uh, 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 a real case uh, of someone discussing parsley, um, and I just can't understand how anyone can like it. So I think what's, what's happening here is that the two parties are um, uh, making it explicit that what they are doing is they're expressing their own um, uh, their own appreciation, or as the case may be, disappreciation of parsley. And the disagreement uh, stays in, to the extent it's a disagreement. Uh, in preferences, but it's not one where they are going to argue much more. On the other hand, uh, you can also imagine that this disagreement persists. So uh, Katie might say, well, look, it's not just that I like parsley. Parsley is delicious to everyone. And he says, well, no, you're wrong. It tastes like <coughs> a, a dry and rough piece of rubbish. And here, so um, they, they could, you can imagine, they're going on and disagreeing. Um, and what I was, uh, so what I suggested in the underdetermination approach is that the, uh, the best reading, the best way to understand uh, parsley is delicious is to understand it as a generic claim that it, it is delicious to people in general or to people who are uh, in the situation of, of uh, tasting parsley. And then you do get disagreement, but one where one of the parties is not so that's, that's an approach which, like now, looking back at it, I think that maybe I didn't distinguish uh, two points which are separate. One idea was that was a much more general methodological point about what kind of um, data you take to build, to argue for the semantic theory, and that's this <coughs> idea that we should go, we should move from it's delicious, no it isn't, as this kind of made up dialogue, and really look at dialogues, how they, uh, how they happen in language. And then there is this second idea that a word like tasty or delicious is semantically underdeterminate and involves an implicit experience or argument, and it's something uh, to which I will come back at the end of the talk. So that was the approach uh, uh, that I was defending and that I would still defend. Um, uh, at the same time, so Michael Glansberg, what he, uh, in his response, he <laughs> looked, so he's also defending a traditional approach to predicates like tasty and delicious, and his focus was on the fact that such predicates are um, gradable adjectives, so um, what, he, uh, what he holds is that they have uh, something that he calls indirect metasemantics, hence the metasemantic approach. Um, so um, in order to interpret a sentence such as this is tasty, what you uh, need to do uh, is that you need to have a certain scale of tastiness and the trash and the cutoff point with respect to which um, uh, the positive form of tasty can, uh, can uh, needs to be interpreted. And um, so this cutoff point can vary from context to context. So if you are um, on an, um, t having an airplane meal, you might say uh, it is delicious. And that can be true because uh, we are um, comparing it to what an airplane meal uh, might be like. But with respect to the same meal, if it was a different context where it was uh, presented as uh, a meal in a two-star Michelin restaurant, uh, to say it is delicious would no longer uh, be true. And here what simply happens is that the, the, the threshold or the cutoff point has changed from one context to the other. And that's something that uh, uh, Michael Lansberg points out has been already known and well studied in the literature on um, gradable adjectives. Um, and the other important thing that he notes is that 
unlike a gradable adjective such as tall, um, predicates of taste, they are multidimensional. So the idea is that if you're going to establish a scale with respect to which to compare uh, two uh, things for their tastiness, um, there are different criteria that you may appeal to in order to establish a common scale. So for example, I can say something like, uh, the breakfast was tastier than the lunch, uh, as for the quality of the ingredients, but the lunch was tastier than breakfast when it comes to the variety uh, of tastes or something like that. So what that suggests is that um, like if you pay more attention to one criterion, such as the ingredients and their, their quality, uh, the scale is going to be different than if you pay more attention to things like a variety. Okay. Uh, now, um, the metalinguistic approach, and that, so in the uh, literature on taste, I think Tim Sundell is someone who has been the more fierce defender of this one. So it, it suggests that disagreements um, may arise, that when we have a taste disagreement, what may also be going on is that the two parties <coughs> are uh, in a context negotiating uh, the meaning of the words they are using. Now, to give you just kind of a, a different sort of case to illustrate the approach, so consider a committee and they're hiring um, uh, somebody and they decide that they want to uh, hire among the candidates the one who has uh, more, most publications. Now, they could still disagree because even though they know all uh, how many things the candidate has written and where those things appear, one uh, member might uh, consider online uh, conference proceedings as uh, bona fide publication and the other one might not. So they could disagree about but, but which candidate has more publications because they have, they attach different meanings, if you wish, to the word publication. And um, so if you switch to matters of taste, the idea might be that when we are discussing about the tastiness of parsley, part of what is going on is that we are also uh, discussing the the concept of tastiness, right? And that, that uh, connects with uh, uh, merely verbal disputes and uh, that we saw yesterday in the uh, <coughs> Okay, now the presuppositional approach, it's um, Dan Lopez de Sa, who has been uh, um, like, um, defending this kind of approach, drawing some ideas from Lewis. Um, and um, what he suggests is that um, in the dialogue, if we go um, and we use a predicate of taste uh, in an unqualified um, uh, way, uh, we usually presuppose that our audience is um, like us in matters of taste. So that's what he calls a presupposition of commonality. Um, and so, if, so even though tastes can differ, if in the context there is the presupposition that we are similarly alike, uh, dialogue of the forum, this is delicious. No, it isn't. With respect to the presupposition that we share the taste, is going to give rise to, uh, to a genuine disagreement. But if you are in a context where, as it turned out, our tastes is, our, our tastes uh, are different, uh, then this presupposition no longer holds, and uh, just going on and disagreeing whether it's delicious becomes deviant. Uh, uh, in, in a similar way in which, for example, if I say um, uh, he's smart and uh, someone says, no, he isn't, uh, but we are talking of different people, maybe uh, without knowing that we are, uh, our, our uh, dialogue is not a disagreement, it's different. Okay, and then the attitudinal approach, so it, it's, it takes inspiration from, uh, from expressivism, but it's a strategy that, was, that can be used for a contextualist so um, what, it, um, uh, what it was about is that um, even if we are just having different attitudes, that already um, uh, gives, uh, um, uh, uh, gives a situation in which we can perceive disagreement. So that uh, even if you are a contextualist and you uh, take that this is delicious, means something like to me this is delicious, the fact about what the semantic content is is not really relevant because you can um, uh, get to explain uh, the intuition of disagreement simply by pointing out that our attitudes are different. So if you have, uh, uh, in the same scenario, so if Katie 
doesn't say this is delicious, but say something like, oh, I really like this. And Rob says, do you? Oh, I totally hate it. Uh, we still get some sense of their disagreement. Um, and it's not about semantics. Right? So uh, that's, that's the response uh, that kind of uh, uh, um, distinguishes uh, what explains the intuition of disagreement and what's happening at the level of what is this. Oh, when did they start? Uh, 35 after, maybe 36 after. Okay, so, um, okay, so then just um, some uh, interim conclusions is that, um, uh, so interest to disagreement in semantic and philosophy of language started from this uh, argument that was meant to motivate semantic, real, uh, um, semantic relativism. Uh, as this, the argument has failed. And uh, we've seen that contextualism, on the other hand, has its, it's a, veil, a variety of mechanisms to explain why we perceive disagreement and why we even actually disagree. And so what I want to do now is um, uh, show that the, the five strategies that have arisen in the, in the discussion don't really compete with each other, but often uh, work in unison. So um, I'm going to present. So, it's something of a case study, and it's in more details in the paper that is in there. And here I should uh, make a warning that um, there may be some bad language, and I uh, apologize if anyone in, uh, in the discussion gets offended. So the study is a case of disagreement. Uh, it's an online disagreement about hipsters. Um, and it starts from a person who, uh, so the question that starts the disagreement is, um, why do so many people hate hipsters? And know that hipsters is here in quotation marks. So, um, so he or she says uh, that he or she's not a hipster. But um, I do know a lot of people who could be considered to be hipsters, and they're really nice, well-educated people, usually very friendly people who would give you the shirt off their back if you needed it, uh, and so on. And so um, wants to know why there are so many other people who uh, hate hipsters. Now, a preliminary remark. So the, the, the title of the, of the uh, uh, discussion is why do so many people hate hipsters? It's, it's really a descriptive cat question. But actually, in the, in the post, uh, almost nobody uh, addresses the descriptive question like, of why people hate them. They really sort of um, go into addressing a, a normative question about whether hipsters deserve to be hated, and if so, why? Uh, and, uh, so, um, so what's I mean, what, what's what's uh, interesting about the case study is that we are now we've passed from these like uh, made up dialogues. This is delicious, no, it isn't, and we are looking at what people how they disagree when it comes to actual disagreement. And what it I think <coughs> actually illustrates is that we have a disagreement in attitude between people who like hipsters and those who dislike them. Uh, a lot of metalinguistic disagreement about who, who counts as hipsters. And then um, we will see the presupposition of commonality uh, come in at different levels. So we'll see that uh, in the debate, so it's, uh, often the parties kind of, um, share uh, some basic values, such as considering kindness as a good thing and arrogance as a bad thing, and then disagree whether hipsters are arrogant or kind. But sometimes this presupposition of common values is going to fail, and uh, so we will we'll illustrate that. So um, disagreement in attitude. Um, so here um, I'm just like taking some some excerpt, excerpts from uh, what people write in this discussion. So um, and I, these are invented names from Swazi. Uh, but she says something like, "I don't hate hipsters as people." I hate the hipster aesthetic because it isn't sincere. Um, and uh, like sort of said, then uh, 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 suggest that hipsters take authenticity to be something that can be bought and displayed. And then says, uh, it pisses me off to no end. And then, so there is someone saying, uh, yes, it's a little irritating, but I find the accompanying pretentiousness to be the most annoying part. So um, <laughs> here, um, so it's it's a disagreement in attitude also at the very at the linguistic level because when you look at what they are saying they are really formulating their, their attitude using the first person pronoun um, I hate 
hipster aesthetic, it pisses me off, uh, I find it such and such. So it's not, uh, it's, it's not <coughs> about anything that's sort of displayed as debatable in the common ground. They're in a way expressing their own uh, dislike, but it's, we, ha we get a, a strong sense uh, of uh, disagreement with the person who wonders why they should be um, uh, hated. And there is, uh, in the same line, uh, one cute uh, quote that I didn't put on the slide, but there is someone who says, well, I can't be a hipster because I'm fat. I can't fit in those skinny jeans, and they look like an idiot in those fluorescent ray buns. That's why I hate hipsters. <laughs> uh, really about he, his, his own attitude. So a lot of disagreement in attitude. So there's, there's, that's really uh, like repetitive. And the other thing that's very prominent in the, in the case study is to which extent it's a metalinguistic disagreement. So I had already pointed out that in the very question, so the, um, uh, the speaker uses quotes. And throughout lots of posts, you have uh, use of quotes, but also other metalinguistic devices that really suggests that part of what is going on is that there is no agreement about who should count as a hipster. So there's someone saying, well, when I think of hipsters, I think of arrogant, and, you know, so I don't want to <laughs> be offensive to anyone, but um, um, then so saying, if someone is that nice, they're not really a hipster by definition. So it's <laughs> interesting that you get this like a uh, really sort of explicit thing about you know who hipsters are. Um, there's a difference between alternative lifestyle and being a hipster. Again, suggesting that it's about you know what what we are taking hipsters to be uh, and so on. So um, another case where uh, you see that it's a lot of disagreement about uh, what the word hipster or the people that it designs designates. And then, um, so when it comes to presupposition <coughs> of reality, um, so um, of course in the debate we sort of start from the assumption that lots of the tastes is going to diverge because the people who like hipsters are probably going to like that sort of taste and the other ones maybe not. Um, but it's a much more, of course, complex kind of case than just disagreement about the tastiness of parsley. Uh, and uh, it's uh, much more complex also because uh, it involves a strong moral dimension because uh, the question is whether hipsters ought to be, whether they deserve to be hated and so um, uh, so people feel compelled to justify that uh, by appealing to more than just uh, how the person dresses and their taste, to appealing to some um, moral quality. So when, when you read the different uh, uh, posts, it's really abundant with, uh, with thick terms uh, and typically if it's a pro-hipster post, it's going to be positive terms uh, or negative in anti-hipster. So here's some examples and this one is from, from the beginning. That they are really nice, well-educated, very friendly. Um, they have a lot of good taste, more intelligent than the average human or artsy. <laughs> Uh, artsy, politically active, and individualistic. Of course, artsy by itself is not a thick term, but in this context, it's given this positive balance. Um, conversely, so there are uh, people who think they deserve to be disliked, um, describe them as hypocritical, pompous, arrogant, snobbish, and sincere, pretentious. Now, um, um, why uh, the presuppositional uh, approach is really, I think, uh, um, well illustrated in this kind of case is that um, it's a disagreement but part of um, makes this disagreement possible is that the two parties agree on some uh, on some um, some basic uh, values so both the parties <coughs> of the are going to value niceness kindness and things like that positively and to value negatively uh, arrogance uh, insincerity and so on. So there is this presupposition that when it comes to some um, more general values, um, they are shared. And then uh, the disagreement turns on the question whether hipsters uh, uh, in general uh, possess either the negative or the positive properties. Um, but uh, we also see cases where uh, some person is going to presuppose something that is then actually rejected by the other people. So 
Um, there are lots of posts where um, uh, people take hipsters to be dislikable because they follow fashion and care about trends and they are described as uh, consumerist where this is given this kind of negative uh, balance. Now, um, they take that to be something that's uh, uh, bad and mutually acknowledged to be bad, but then uh, some speakers explicitly uh, reject this sort of presupposition. So here is a, a, a one example that nicely illustrates that you may uh, reject the presupposition. Um, so um, she says, I don't understand why some people, myself included, are automatically trend whores, um, quoting uh, the, uh, the expression used by somebody else when all we do is buy clothes that we think make us look nice. So what she's doing here is rejecting the presupposition that if, you're, if you care about fashion, that there is something bad about that, right? So we have a disagreement here, <coughs> not about a property that hipsters have. So the two parties agree, say, that hipsters care about fashion, but uh, one associates a negative connotation with that, while the other person says there's nothing bad about caring about fashion. So just some lessons. Uh, uh, it's a very complex case of disagreement, but what it nicely illustrates is that all these um, responses that have arise to, uh, to in, the, in the contextualist literature uh, are often um, uh, um, present and work together. Um, and so um, in the remainder of the talk, what I would like to do, um, maybe I should just mention that, so we've, uh, I, I've stressed in this case study uh, this idea of disagreement in attitude, metalinguistic disagreement, uh, presupposition of commonality. We didn't see the underdetermination approach and the metasemantic approach. Uh, um, so the underdetermination approach, in, in a way, like this methodological um, idea does show up in the study because you know, are hipsters dislikable? To see what's really going on, what kind of disagreement it is, we need to look at the context. But um, uh, there is, hipster is not a gradable adjective and it's not experience or sensitive. So those two first responses were really targeted at predicates of personal taste. So what they want to do now at this uh, last bit of the talk is look again, go back and look at predicates of personal taste. And, um, uh, just very quickly, um, try to show that they are interestingly different from moral and aesthetic predicates. Now, it, it connects with some uh, vexed issues from uh, 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 linguistics on the syntax, semantics, pragmatics interface, namely the issue of an experience or argument, um, or the imp implicit arguments in general, uh, and um, uh, in in the, in the literature, two main tests have been used to see whether a predicate like delicious comes with some sort of a hidden argument uh, that uh, can take as a value the person who is experiencing deliciousness. Um, so one test is whether it can be felicitously used with uh, expressions such as two and four. Um, so you can say things like the dish was, was tasty to Katie or tasty for Katie. Um, but, uh, uh, a word that doesn't have an experience or argument such a vegetarian is going to be infelicitous with such a construction. So if you say the dish was vegetarian to Katie, that's infelicitous. And the other kind of test is whether the expression can be used with uh, 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 embedded under the verb fine. So it's very uh, uh, felicitous to say that Katie finds the dish tasty, but you wouldn't say that she finds the dish vegetarian. Uh, so, um, just as a warning, so these tests are, are uh, indicative rather than conclusive, and there are several problems. So, one is that uh, the two and the four and the datives, they don't distinguish experience arguments from a beneficiary argument, uh, as in Katie is kind to Bob. Uh, so, it's not, kind is not experience or sensitive, but it's more uh, who she's kind to or um, circulating papers is helpful for most students. Again, uh, students are here uh, being the beneficiaries of, uh, of what uh, uh, circulating papers is helpful for. And also, um, sometimes we can um, 
just use two and four in the sense where it simply means something like in the opinion of, and we saw in the in the previous case study uh, example, so someone saying hipsters to me are all about reducing uh, meaningful things to consumerism here, to me, it's not, it has nothing to do with experience risk, it's simply a way of saying in my opinion. Um, and then similarly with the predicate fine, you can, in suitable context, um, put, uh, use an expression with this predicate, even though the expression is not, does not have any, any hidden arguments. So if, um, uh, if we are in a context where we don't really know from which uh, um, height to judge somebody as tall, uh, you can say, well, like, what do you think? I could say, I find this person tall. And uh, even though tall doesn't have anything like an experiencer, fine works well because it suggests that uh, based on my experience with like, people's height in general, I would judge this person tall. But, but the important thing is that um, it's still a sort of indicative test in the sense that um, um, if, if some predicates are going to be less felicitous with we <coughs> do, we have good evidence to say that they don't have experiencers. And um, uh, we, we've argued, I've argued that that's what happens with uh, uh, most of uh, moral and aesthetic predicates, that they're, uh, they're different from predicates of taste when it comes to those two tests. So um, uh, it's pretty infelicitous to say something like, female circumcision is wrong to many doctors, it's just not good to put it that way and um, it, uh, it, it doesn't have a reading where the doctors judge that to be uh, morally wrong um, and to take, a, so wrong as, as a moral uh, adjective and to take a case of something that's considered an aesthetic adjective or aesthetic concept, so balanced. Um, uh, consider Rizla based poetry is balanced to most scholars, that's also, that doesn't sound very good. And it doesn't get this, this reading that uh, um, most scholars uh, judge it to be balanced. Okay. Um, and similarly with find, you wouldn't say things like many doctors find female superstition wrong. You would preferably say things like they consider uh, circumcision wrong or uh, most scholars consider Louise LeBay's poetry uh, balanced uh, rather than saying finely balanced. So uh, the, the judgments are very subtle for all those reasons that I was pointing out, but there is arguably some something <coughs> to be drawn. Now, um, what's the upshot of, of this? Um, so the upshot for the disagreement um, phenomenon is that if we are right in thinking that predicates of personal taste are, um, have this um, uh, somewhat more complex uh, argument structure than some other predicates. Uh, when you just have a, a, a sentence where the predicate of, occurs, like the meal was tasty, so it's more likely to um, uh, give uh, rise to different possible interpretations than a predicate that doesn't have any such implicit argument. So um, that's what it suggests, is that if you're going to look then at um, conversations and disagreement patterns that involve one sort of predicate or the other, there can be things happening in the case of predicates of taste, uh, so sources that uh, um, make it possible to understand the claims differently, and that may lead to um, disagreements slash misunderstandings that shouldn't arise with uh, conversations which uh, involve predicates that don't have any experience or um, arguments. Okay. So um, just summing up uh, briefly what I've tried to do in this talk, um, I've um, surveyed, uh, surveyed the argument from Fulton's disagreement and the role that it has <coughs> in semantics and philosophy of language. I think that um, it's fair to say that uh, um, uh, at this point, uh, not many people think that this argument uh, shows anything about uh, relative semantics being preferable to other frameworks or the, or the other way around, but it has still had some very uh, fruitful results in that uh, this interest uh, uh, to disagreement cases has made it possible to um, look at um, 
various mechanisms uh, that we find in language uh, and this, can, this fine grained structure that can lead uh, to sources uh, uh, of disagreement in, in various ways and various ways. And then um, lastly, I, uh, uh, I looked at some uh, uh, subtle linguistic features that uh, suggest that uh, disagreements over taste are interestingly different from aesthetic and moral disagreements. Thank you. Cool, great. Uh, cool, so I just I want to thank Isadora for a very helpful summary of like at least 6,000 pages of literature on this stuff. Um, it was amazing that she was able to do that in such a short amount of time. Uh, so yeah, in, in this paper, um, she does three main things. So first, she kind of provides this survey on the literature of faultless disagreement and its implications for like the relativism, contextualism, expressivism debate. Um, she then provides kind of illustration of these things with um, Zeth Vipsters, and then she suggests that um, from a linguistic perspective, predicates of personal taste and moral or aesthetic predicates behave very differently with respect to whether they have these experience arguments. So um, what I want to do is just first kind of slowly agree um, from a kind of different perspective with her first claim, which is that um, intuitions about faultless disagreement won't really help us to settle questions about contextualism, relativism, uh, and all of these different semantic frameworks, and kind of maybe um, point to a few other things that people in the literature have thought might settle these debates, other than just intuitions about policy disagreements. So that's the first thing I'll do. Uh, and then the second thing I'll do is um, maybe put a bit of pressure on the claim, the, the final claim of Isadora, so the claim that um, moral slash aesthetic predicates and predicates of personal tastes behave so differently. Um, and I'll argue that, um, especially when there's thick moral predicates involved, then the distinction may not be as sharp as he suggests. Um, good, so, so the literature on faultless disagreement, um, as Isidore presents it, um, has these three intuitions. The first is that uh, in disagreements like the one about parsley, um, there's faultlessness, that is, maybe both participants are right. Also, there's disagreement. Um, because they're saying things like no and you're wrong and um, a certain negation of the sentence that the other says and whatever. Um, and then the incompatibility intuition, which is that if, there are those, if there's faultlessness and there's disagreement, you've got a contradiction. So you can't have disagreement with faultlessness. Um, and so uh, it's true that all of these things are pretty intuitive. That is, there's definitely a sense in um, these debates about parsley that um, there's some kind of disagreement and there's some kind of faultlessness and some kinds of disagreement and some kinds of faultlessness might be incompatible with each other. Um, but it's kind of less easy to say exactly what these intuitions amount to more precisely. So um, there are lots of different things that people might mean by disagreement and lots of people things that people might mean by faultlessness. And once we distinguish all of the things that really do need to be distinguished, that is, really do like, like make different pronouncements on different kinds of cases, um, it's not really any more clear that any intuitions are going to help us settle any debates. And so I think um, that's kind of good positive evidence for Isadora's first claim. And to, to, just to kind of, like, to kind of give a, a, one example of a kind of distinction which you might make um, about disagreement, for example. Um, so disagreement definitely requires more than just saying no and asserting the negation of the other person's sentence. Um, if I am on the phone with you and you're in London and I'm in Berkeley, but I think that you're in London with me and it's raining where I am and not raining where you are, um, I might say it's raining here and you might disagree with me. You might say, no, it's not raining here. Um, and then we might argue about this for a while. Intuitively, this isn't a real disagreement, right? This is just a misunderstanding. And so to have a disagreement, you need more than just this. You need um, some kind of like incompatibility in attitudes. And different theories are going to allow for just different kinds of incompatibilities in attitudes. So like say that, um, for example, I want to eat, uh, this is an example that John McFarland discusses. Um, I might want to eat a cupcake. You might want to eat a cupcake. There might only be one cupcake. Um, and so we asked, like, do we agree or disagree here about our desires? Well, in a sense, we agree because we both have exactly the same desire. We both desire that we eat a cupcake, right? We desire the same thing with respect to the cupcake. Um, but those desires could never be true, or couldn't, in this case, be made true at the same time because there's only one cupcake. 
So in this case, like in the sense of could our desires both be satisfied, we kind of disagree, right? We, we, we don't have desires that could both be true or both come true. Um, uh, but in a sense, the desires are the same. Um, or say that you want to eat the top of the cupcake alone, and I want to eat the bottom of the cupcake alone. Um, in that sense, you can ask, like, do we agree or disagree? Well, uh, in the sense of, like, could our desires both be true, like, could the contents both come true, um, now we don't disagree anymore, because we have, uh, I have a desire to the top, and a desire to the bottom, there's a top and there's a bottom, and we can both go away happy. But in another sense, we disagree about our desires, or our desires stand in some kind of conflict, because I couldn't adopt your desire without getting rid of my original desire. Um, and so I, I guess um, th there are lots more distinctions that we can make, um, and different semantic theories will make different pronouncements about whether uh, these things are possible. Like in, in, in McFarland's book, for example, I think there are like at least two different kinds of disagreements and four different kinds of faultlessness dis distinguished, and there probably are even more. And I guess the, the general point is just once we make all of the relevant distinctions, um, it's no longer clear that like, in each specific way of fleshing out disagreement and specific way of fleshing out faultlessness, um, intuitions about what's possible are really going to help us settle any, any of these questions. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, uh, it's generally just true that we're not going to be able to take intuitions about faultless disagreement and get like a semantic theory out of it at the end of the day. What if people thought um, will help instead to distinguish between like contextualism, relativism, all of these different semantic frameworks? Um, I mean, there, there are just two things which I'll briefly mention. One is um, norms about what you're permitted to assert and retract in certain situations. So this is like a very McFarlanian framework. Um, so like if I like parsley as a child and then come not to like it as an adult, and I, I, like I said like a few days ago when I hated parsley, I, this is not tasty. Um, do, am I required to take back now my assertion or can I stand by it? Um, and these, these questions uh, might have a bit like more determinate answers than these questions about false disagreement. Um, and then the second thing that people have looked at is compositional data. So um, how these words like tasty or um, beautiful or whatever interact with conditionals or supposition. Um, and these sorts of things um, can pull apart uh, predictions that, expre that expressivism or contextualism or relativism sort of thing. Um, and so I guess um, all of this is to say by way of the first part, like um, it, it, what Isidore says seems just right, that um, we're not going to take all this disagreement, take intuitions about that, get a semantic theory. That's not to say that these semantic theories are all just on a par. There's other data, but it's not going to come from all this disagreement. Um, Okay, so I think I, I, I'm done now slowly disagreeing with the first part of Isidore's talk. Um, and that now I want to um, maybe just put a little bit of pressure on her last concluding part. So the last concluding part was, remember, uh, there are, on the one hand, there are predicates of personal taste, which come with these experiencer arguments. Um, and on the other hand, she argues, there are moral or aesthetic predicates, which don't, she argues, come, come with these experiencer um, arguments. Um, and so the, the general idea here is that it sounds fine to say um, roller coasters are fun to me but not to you. Um, it doesn't sound fine to say like uh, that roller coaster is over five feet tall to me but not to you. Um, and so this is evidence that maybe when we interpret words like fun, there's always this implicit experiencer um, lurking there that we interpret it with respect to. Um, and what Isadora points out is that while, while predicates of personal taste, like fun or cool or something like that, um, uh, pass the tests for having um, experience or arguments, moral predicates or genuine aesthetic predicates don't. So we, it doesn't seem like we can say circumcision is wrong to most doctors. Uh, it doesn't seem like we can say Herodotus' poetry is balanced to most scholars. Um, and so in that respect, moral predicates and, and aesthetic predicates behave a lot more like just over five feet tall, just like straightforward factual predicates than predicates of personal taste. Um, another kind of test that Isidore doesn't mention, but I think also bolsters her case, are what um, people have called bound readings. So um, take a predicate of personal taste like fun. Um, say that like Johnny thinks that roller coasters are fun, Sally thinks that only Ferris wheels are fun, um, uh, it seems like Johnny, uh, and say that Johnny rides a fer uh, roller coaster and Sally rides the Ferris wheel, 
It seems like Johnny could well say, describe the situation with everybody did something fun at the amusement park, where that doesn't mean everybody did something that Johnny considers fun. It means like everybody did something that they themselves considered fun. And this phenomenon arises for Tasty too. Like um, if uh, a bunch of people, you know, like you all have different tastes. Um, it seems like I could, yeah, but you all got like a sandwich that you consider tasty. I can say like everybody in this room got a tasty sandwich, and that seems like a fine way to do it. So this is another test, like whether these bound readings are possible um, is something that can tease apart whether there are these implicit argue, uh, experience or arguments that we're about. Um, and so this also seems to pattern as Isidore suggests in the moral case. So um, yeah, everybody did something fun where people have different understandings of fun seems fine. If people have different understandings of what the moral thing to do is, like say that a bunch of doctors in one country do a bunch of circumcisions uh, and, a, and a bunch of doctors in another country don't, it seems like you couldn't describe that with everybody did the moral or ethical thing. It, that just sounds really weird. Um, you, <laughs> the person saying this is always meaning his idea about what moral um, and so that, that's kind of a friendly point. This third test for whether there are experiencers also goes in this direction. Um, but I, I guess I want to suggest that with thick predicates like arrogant or honorable or brave, we are more inclined to accept sentences like this. So, the same kinds of, like, okay, so thick moral predicates, these are things that have kind of a factual component and an evaluative component, not just like good or bad, which is just evaluative, or five feet tall or not five feet tall, which is just descriptive, but things like arrogance or self-confidence, which seem to suggest some, they seem to involve some kind of evaluation and some kind of factual component. So like, if, if you know that somebody's arrogance, you probably can deduce that they're not shy, so there's some kind of descriptive content there. But if you call somebody arrogant, you can also infer that you have some kind of like a negative attitude toward this. Um, and it seems like if Mary finds the same properties of people um, like good, or uh, sorry, um, I guess bad in this case. Um, so like say that there's some self-confident person, John, um, and Mary thinks that uh, John is like quote really arrogant and Sally thinks that he's just self-confident. It seems like we can describe this situation with the two constructions um, that we find in predicates of personal taste. So it seems like we can say, John is arrogant to Mary, but self-confident to Sally. And that sounds great, I think. Um, uh, we can also, I, it seems like with, um, uh, th this happens in other kinds of moral predicates. So um, you could say maybe suicide missions in the course of war are brave and honorable to the Japanese people, but foolhardy to the American people. Um, and these are definitely in the moral sphere, um, and it, but it seems like um, these kind of two constructions also find constructions um, work perfectly well. It seems like you can say that uh, Japanese people find the suicide missions in the course of war is brave and honorable, American people don't. Um, and so now it seems like these thick moral predicates are patterning much more like the predicate pers predicates of personal taste. Um, finally, I think bound readings, the, Maybe this is a bit harder to hear, like, but I think you can hear them. So like, Bob and Richard both did something brave. Imagine a circumstance in which they both have very different ideas about what bravery is. Maybe Bob thinks that like bravery is only, you can only be brave if you're like fighting a battle, and Richard thinks that you can only be brave if you're like expressing your true feelings. And say that Bob expresses his, or no, Bob goes to battle, Richard expresses his true feelings. Um, it seems like even Bob could say, like, Bob and Richard both did something brave. Maybe. I, I think my intuitions aren't as clear in this one. Um, but I guess the, the, uh, the, general, the general point is just that, um, so I think Isidore is right that with these, like, straightforward, pure, normative predicates, like good, bad, um, these two constructions, these fine constructions, uh, these bound readings sound really weird. But I think with these thick moral predicates, they, at least the two and the fine and the consider, all sound fine. Bound readings are less clear, but it at least suggests that the kind of stark linguistic distinction between um, like the moral and the aesthetic on the one hand, and then the predicates of personal taste on the other hand, maybe isn't as stark as Isidore suggests. Um, but I also think that like this is just kind of an interesting fact in itself. Like why should thick moral predicates allow these two and fine constructions and 
like just pure moral predicates not allow it, I'm not sure I'd like a good theory of that. I mean, I think this is just independent of Isidore's paper. This is just kind of an interesting fact. Um, so good, I'll, I'll leave it at that and um, yeah, hopefully I appreciate it.